Welcome to the sixth set of presentations in the second webinar series presented by the International Absorption Society. The IAS is an international organization dedicated to advancing absorption as a scientific solution, engineering solution, and, help, and a solution to human welfare challenges through the promotion of absorption research and education. We hope that all of our attendees and their families and their colleagues are safe amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We thank everyone for attending the webinar today. The webinar series, which began in the spring of 2020 and then restarted last autumn, has been an immense success and the recordings of those webinars continue to be viewed on YouTube. We, plan, uh, we continue to plan these webinars through the present academic year with a variety of speakers from industry, academia, and other re research institutes, as well as PhD students and early career researchers. Subsequent webinars will be announced on the IAS mailing list and the IAS Twitter feed. Today's webinar will be given by Danny Shade, a PhD student at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and Kasturi Nagesh Pai, a PhD student at the University of Alberta. Both of these students were Best Poster Award recipients at the inaugural IAS Twitter Poster Conference. I am Nicholas Wilkins at the University of Alberta and the IAS Student Education Committee. Today's webinar will be moderated by Valentina Stampy Bombelli of ETH Zurich in Switzerland. We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, or other, in, other moderators are not necessarily those of the IAS or the institutions associated with those individuals. We ask that you consider joining the IAS as a regular member if you are not already. Our dues are minimal, only about 20 US dollars per year to support the publication of our flagship journal, absorption, contribute to travel grants and workshops, seed funding for IAS members and affiliated groups, as well as aid the organization of our triennial conference on the fundamentals of absorption. Members also receive free access to IAS supported materials, including our journal, as well as the absorption database published by Springer Materials. Anyone can follow the IAS on Twitter at int at SOS for future updates in regarding IAS events, webinars, and information about scientific meetings. Please help expand our YouTube channel by subscribing. We would like to remind the viewers of the upcoming Fundamentals of Absorption Conference in Broomfield, Colorado between May 22nd and May 27th in 2022. More information can be found on the website given on the slide. The presentations given in today's webinar and for the webinar in August are by the recipients of the Best Poster Award in the inaugural IES Twitter Poster Conference, which was held between the 7th and 11th of December, 2020. The five recipients were chosen by a committee of judges, most of which were members of the IAS Education Committee. All five recipients were invited and have agreed to give talks in the July and August webinars. So now I'll hand it off to Valentina to introduce our first speaker today. All right, so our next speaker is Kasturi Nagesh Pai. Kasturi Nagesh Pai is a PhD student in chemical engineering at the University of Alberta. He expects to graduate soon in the fall of 2021. Nagesh completed his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering at RV College of Engineering in India in 2013, and then worked for Reliance Industries until 2015. He then came to the University of Alberta to do his master's degree in, chem in chemical engineering, which he finished in 2017, and then continued with his uh, PhD. His research, his research includes Sorry, his research includes um, absorptive, absorptive gas separations, including carbon capture and oxygen concentration, primarily using numerical and data-driven artificial intelligent, uh, intelligence approaches for process modeling design and optimization. And as before, um, the questions can come via Zoom or via YouTube, and we will take questions for Nagesh and then subsequently again for Danny at the end of the presentation. So Nagesh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Uh, let me just share my presentation real quick. 
Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to my talk here uh, today, which is on uh, data driven approach to modeling press pressure swing adsorption uh, uh, processes. So I'd like to first begin by uh, giving a brief introduction of uh, adsorbents. So adsorbents are solid uh, porous materials that have affinity to certain gases from a mixture of gases. We can use this property to uh, separate out gas mixtures and uh, we can use this property to create uh, processes that can uh, separate out mixtures of gases uh, to produce hydrogen, to separate air, to have medical oxygen concentrators, and in more recent times, uh, it can be used to uh, separate CO2 from flue gas for CO2 capture. So. Uh, generally, when we talk about isotherms, uh, adsorbents, we try to, we like to characterize them using uh, what we call as isotherms. So these are uh, 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 plots that show how much of the gas uh, has adsorbed onto the surface as a function of pressure. And we can uh, generally uh, measure them using experimental setups or using uh, atomistic simulations to predict the gas loadings. Now, uh, once we have an isotherm, we'll know how much of uh, the uh, gas uh, adsorbs onto the su surface of this ad adsorbent. And then by changing either the temperature or the pressure of this system in a TSA or a PSA framework, we can build processes that can exploit this affinity to separate the mixtures. Now, uh, we can calculate uh, metrics such as working capacity and selectivity, but it has been shown that these uh, metrics uh, do not uh, really uh, are good, good representations of the final process performance. So the, the process that we are looking at today in, uh, in detail is CO2 capture, and, and specifically uh, CO2 capture from flue gas that contains CO2 and nitrogen. And the, the gas compositions of this can vary from coal, natural gas, uh, or steel or cement industries. So a wide range of uh, flue gas compositions. And what we want to do here is to separate the CO2 for sequestration and storage. and uh, at, at certain constraints that the process is required to do, which is uh, specified by either the uh, like uh, US Department of Energy and so on. So the process inherently uh, is, is twofold. So you have to pick the right adsorbent with the right process cycle. And the process cycle here, the, it can be, like I said, a temperature swing or a vacuum pressure swing process. And it can have a, a variety of different uh, adsorber setups such as fixed beds or moving beds etc so to begin with how do we model an adsorption process let's take the case of fixed bed uh, 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 a fixed pack bed where each uh, where the adsorbent is pelletized and filled into the pack bed to to describe the the uh, the dynamics of this column we we essentially solve a set of partial differential equations that describe the the the, the heat and mass transfer through the the column we can then ap uh, apply appropriate boundary conditions to uh, design processes that can separate out gases like what i've shown here on the uh, on the right which is uh, we have a four step cycle here that separates co2 from nitrogen and uh, how it does it is we send in a mixture of CO2 and nitrogen at a specific pressure into the into the bed. And here, uh, the CO2 uh, preferentially adsorbs onto the surface of the adsorbent. And then the nitrogen uh, gets released into the, uh, the, uh, the top end of the column. After this, we reduce the pressure of the system in a co-current blowdown step, where we remove the rest of the residual nitrogen from uh, from the bed, followed by which uh, we are, we remove the the adsorbed CO2 by uh, applying a, a deep vacuum. This is then cyclically uh, run by first bringing it back into the initial conditions of pressure, and we can then measure performance indicators such as purity recovery uh, and so on that that can help us uh, pick uh, 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 or measure the performance of these materials. So uh, let me show you a quick case study of how we go ahead, uh, go and uh, uh, model these processes. So we take an isotherm, 
uh, of, uh, and we parameterize it and fit it to a, uh, a Langmuir model or some sort of a predictive model for uh, for our uh, simulations. And then uh, we randomly pick some uh, operating conditions like time of the adsorption step, the pressure levels, or the velocity of the feed and so on. And then what we do is we iteratively uh, run these specific boundary conditions that represent the different steps, which in this case are the adsorption step, the co-current blowdown, counter-current blowdown, and the pressurization step. And we run it iteratively till uh, the process reaches a cyclic steady state. As you may all uh, be aware, a pre uh, adsorption, unit, uh, adsorption processes uh, tend to uh, uh, be unsteady state in nature and tend to reach a, 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 a state called a cyclic steady state only after we run it for a certain amount of uh, cycles. And at this point, it, uh, we then go ahead and measure our uh, performance indicators like purity and recovery and so on. So we call this setup uh, the full model. And each uh, simulation for each of these operating conditions, like one parameter, one uh, simulation takes about three core minutes on a normal computer. So now to optimize or to figure out where the best performance lies, we uh, we optimize the operating conditions in a given range uh, as shown here. So we take the adsorption uh, uh, time has a, a specific range. Uh, uh, we give uh, the optimizer a range for pressure uh, as well as velocity. And we, uh, and then, we uh, let the optimizer pick points in this given range and simulate each of uh, these variables for one isotherm. And as, uh, as you can see here, I've shown the performance for uh, a hypothetical case where I've plotted CO2 recovery and CO2 purity. Uh, and each of these points represent one specific sim simulation. And what we do is the optimizer then optimizes this over a number of iterations till we reach uh, the, the, uh, the best case scenario, which here is represented by this outer boundary, which we call as the Pareto front, which represents the best purity and recovery trade off that we can achieve. Anything above this Pareto front is uh, infeasible and anything below is suboptimal uh, when we are talking in context of op optimization. Now, uh, this entire process of optimization takes around seven core days for a single material to perform and with the context of uh, uh, MOFs and adsorbents and the, the, the sheer number of adsorbents that have been uh, generated, uh, doing this uh, traditional screening uh, process becomes quite computationally challenging. As, as I've shown here in this uh, graph, uh, uh, has a function of number of adsorbents and the computational time required. As we increase the number of adsorbents that we need to screen or simulate or optimize, uh, the overall computational time uh, linearly increases to a point where if we were to just uh, screen, uh, let's say a thousand materials, it already becomes computationally uh, restrictive uh, to do so. So what we have to be looking at in terms of screening or uh, modeling these processes is uh, a reliable yet fast technique to model these processes. So we've already uh, mentioned that s simple metrics such as selectivity and working capacity do not show the entire picture of uh, screening these materials. And simplified models, uh, again, uh, are faster, but again, do not show the entire picture of uh, the final performance. So what we uh, suggest, uh, what we've been doing is using a supervised machine learning to uh, uh, achieve fast computational times while keeping uh, a very high reliability in prediction. So to be, uh, here I will introduce the, the framework that I've, uh, I will be presenting, which is the machine assisted adsorption process learner and emulator, which we call, um, uh, which is short for MAPLE, which uh, is charact uh, characterized by uh, an ag it's adsorbent agnostic, as in uh, we can input any adsorbent and it doesn't have to be retrained. Uh, it can then uh, give us uh, 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 the results without it trying to iteratively reach cyclic steady state. So the results are instantaneous. Th these models uh, are very, uh, they emulate the PSA process 
to uh, uh, to the T. So it it can be used to uh, 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 optimize these processes, and then this model can screen materials. Uh, and uh, as I'll show you later, these have been validated experimentally. And then we can uh, use these uh, models to explore the inverse problem uh, or the adsorbent design problem. So. Uh, the basics here is that this uh, neural network model takes in the same inputs as what our detailed model does, such as your times, pressures, and velocities, but also the, the uh, isotherm parameters, such as uh, your saturation capacity, your uh, heat of adsorption, or your uh, equilibrium constant, uh, your Henry constants. So uh, what, it, uh, what we do with these inputs is we feed it to our trained neural network, and it gives us uh, performance indicators like purity, recovery, uh, et cetera, instantaneously. Versus before we had to iteratively solve our equations till we reach cyclic steady state. So how we do this is we take a large, sam uh, a large set of uh, samples, uh, which are sampled using a Latin helper cube sampling technique. So here the inputs are material in nature, such as the adsorption, uh, the isotherms, the uh, saturation capacity, heat of adsorption, the density of the, the particle, et cetera. And we describe this using a single site extended Langmuir model to describe the competitive behavior also. And we also take in uh, process inputs like the times, pressures, and velocities. And we simulate around 20,000 unique samples. And we save our uh, bed profiles and performance indicators and so on. What we can do then is use these as label data to train our uh, neural network to predict what the performance is. So what we do is we replace our detailed model with this neural network, which has uh, which has all the inputs exactly like the detailed model. And with new inputs, we can predict what the outputs will be. So here I've just shown a test set result for the purity recovery energy and productivity for the uh, for our specific adsorption uh, for our uh, specific case study and we can see that the maple model and the detailed full model have very uh, very good agreement with the, each other so what does that mean so that means that uh, let's say now that we have trained our maple model we can take uh, any adsorbents like zeolite 13x for example here uh, and input that has a uh, uh, the material inputs using uh, our Langmuir model. And then we can run an optimization. So here I've shown you the same uh, Pareto front for uh, recovery and pur uh, purity for the same case study for different feed compositions. As, uh, uh, as you can see here, we are going from a feed composition of 10% uh, all the way to around 20%. So uh, the, the lines here represent what the, the the, the maple model were, uh, gives us as the most optimal case. And the symbols here are, again, uh, run using the detail model in the exact same framework with the exact same optimization range. And we can see that uh, both models uh, in the, on, uh, can predict the optimal uh, points for our system very well. And now we can do the same with a constraint a constraint of pure, uh, CO2 purity, which is something that uh, is needed when you're designing a CO2 capture plants, which is to capture the CO2 at a, a, a high purity of 95, 96%. And uh, the same can be done for uh, productivity recovery optimizations. Here, I've shown you the exact same things for the uh, exact same pro of plots for different feed compositions. Where, uh, here, what you should notice is, as we increase the, the feed composition, the separation becomes easier to perform, which again is an intuitive result, but it's very interesting to see that both the, the machine learned maple model as well as the detail model uh, show us the same results. Now, and a very uh, important thing to do when we are designing models, especially uh, data-driven models, is to validate them with experiments. So this is what we did here. So we took one of the Pareto uh, that we had shown earlier. Uh, uh, and for a system, we picked three uh, points on this optimal range. And we had run uh, these operating conditions of time, pressure, velocity uh, for a, a case of zeolite 13x in our, in our columns. And we got uh, the performance through our lab scale setup. 
uh, and here in the the blue is the detail model results for the same uh, operating conditions uh, when we take the same operating conditions and run it on a maple model we get our uh, we get our uh, red symbols here and now once we uh, run this and we get our performance and we plot it here we see that even the experimental results uh, are uh, tend to be very uh, similar to what the detail model uh, and the maple model have predicted. So uh, we can essentially say that uh, these uh, models can be used to optimize uh, specific adsorbent processes. So next, what we did was we uh, we took this model and we screened 36 adsorbents from the literature that were reported by Kurana and Farooq uh, in, uh, in their paper in 2016, where they had screened uh, these materials for uh, CO2 capture. We essentially uh, recreated their study uh, using the maple model this time. And here I've shown a con uh, on top a confusion matrix of DOE and non-DOE as described by uh, Manandar and Kurana. And then we did the same with our study and we found that this was our confusion matrix. And as you can see, it has an excellent uh, prediction for classification of DOE or non-DOE. Next, what we did was we took each of those materials and minimized their energy for the, the, the given constraints of purity and recovery. And we plotted them against what uh, was reported in the literature and we found that they are uh, very, uh, they are very good predictors of the final minimized energy. And here I had, I would like you to note that this was all, the, uh, all the maple model predictions are inst almost instantaneous, while the detail model uh, takes about seven core days to do each point. So. Uh, to conclude this part, uh, I would like to state that uh, the, the, the machine learned maple model uh, takes a slight amount of training effort more than our traditional case. But uh, as you can see here, only after screening about five or six materials, it already beats the traditional approach uh, uh, when it comes to computational time. And when you are screening larger and larger databases, uh, we find that uh, the order of savings uh, of computation increases. And when you're doing around 10,000 materials, we have a, around three orders of uh, magnitude computational savings for uh, using our model. So till now, I've been uh, talking in context of screening materials that have been uh, reported in the literature or, uh, or been hypothesized using uh, computational methods. So this would be represented by all of this region. So what we do uh, or what people do is they measure the adsorbent equilibria. Then uh, we computationally design the process till it reaches cyclic steady state, measure performance, optimize the performance, and then take the, the, the top materials and uh, show that they're, they can be experimentally uh, validated in, uh, in some setup followed by costing and scale up studies. This is the traditional approach. Now, what if we, uh, now that we have this model that's trained for any adsorbent, what if we were to take the entire adsorbent space? This would include anything that has not been or been synthesized. And we ask ourselves the question, what, what if we optimize the best adsorbent for the best process uh, for the best process conditions what is the uh, like what is the practically achievable performance limits so we do this by keeping both the uh, the material inputs as well as the process inputs has decision variables in our optimization we optimize this process for different feed compositions so we optimize both the material and process simultaneously and by doing this when we go back and check what the, the features are for our optimal case, we can find out what the best uh, material, uh, how the best material looks looks like. And this has been uh, done previously by Maninder and Farooq as well for a specific gas composition. So here, what we are trying to recreate is uh, uh, for uh, any given uh, CO2 uh, in the feed composition. So I'll show you this slide here which is uh, on the uh, x-axis is feed composition for CO2. 
and on the y axis is the energy uh, consumption per ton of co2 captured this is all subject to department of energy uh, uh, specifications for the co2 product and what you can see here in the green is the thermodynamic limit of separation for this case for the different gas compositions as you can see uh, it's fairly uh, high energy when it has very less co2 in the system and slightly lower uh, energy uh, requirements when there is a higher compos composition of co2 in the system just above that is e2 e2 here represents what is the theoretical best uh, performance when we optimize both the material and the process uh, for a given uh, vacuum pump efficiency of 100%. So all our mechanical prime movers are all perfect. So this is the best energy that we can hope to achieve using the best adsorbent as well as the best uh, operating conditions and the best uh, prime movers. Now, if we take in uh, industrial levels of efficiency into account for these prime movers, we get E3. Here, uh, again, E3 uh, represents the best energies that can be achieved when we optimize both the material as well as the process. Now, we, if we change this process to a slightly different one, we get E4. So here, the difference uh, lies between uh, four step with LPP or four step with uh, feed pressurization. And we can see that uh, this is essentially the practical limits of our separation that uh, we can achieve by optimizing the material as well. So what does that uh, look like? So let's take four different positions in our plot. Uh, at 5%, 15%, 25%, and 35%. And we plot this spider plot, which plots all the dimensions that are inputs to our uh, uh, model. So as you can see here, they're quite similar, but there are certain points where there's a slight uh, deviation. And this is all done for uh, energy minimization problem, right? So now if we plot these materials, uh, uh, and against like and juxtapose them against like real world materials like uh, zeolite 13x or MOF such as UTSA or ISOP, this is how they would look like in the ideal case. Now we can do the same for uh, productivity optimization as I've shown here for the two different processes. And we can uh, plot the same for the different feed compositions. And here I'd like to iterate that this is each position has a uh, unique isotherm associated with it. And we can see this more clearly here, where uh, for different gas compositions, the, the optimizer is suggesting that we have slightly different CO2 isotherms. Uh, and if you go back and check the nitrogen isotherms for the energy case, we see a similar trend here, uh, but uh, not for CO2. Now, this is uh, quite interesting. So uh, what if we take these materials such as zeolite 13x, UTSA, or isopmorph, and do the same uh, by optimizing just their operating conditions. We get E5, E6, and E7. So E7 is zeolite 13x, which is uh, generally uh, considered as a commercial benchmark because it's a commercial adsorbent. And we see that by switching it to a uh, morph such as isop morph, we've already saved a large amount of energy consumption. Uh, but we also notice that uh, uh, MOFs have already caught up to what could be theoretically the best uh, case uh, with uh, regions of improvement to be uh, like 20% more uh, in terms of energy uh, saved. But it also uh, tells us that the, the, the new directions that we have to look into our uh, water stability and so on uh, that we have not considered in this case study. So we can, we've done the same for uh, productivity optimization as well, where you can again see a similar trend with the data. Now, uh, the question uh, or the, 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 the Twitter tag that I'd given for my talk, uh, uh, my poster was fantastic adsorbents and where to find them. So uh, what, I've, uh, what I did here was uh, I took the Henry constant of CO2 and the Henry constant of nitrogen uh, and parameterized this over the space. So each of these uh, points represents a unique material uh, that has a certain composite, uh, a certain uh, uh, saturation capacity, heat of adsorption, and so on. And we optimize the energy in this case for each of these locations using our Maple model. And then we plot the energies uh, uh, has a contour uh, 
on this plot. And the lines on the diagonal are the constant selectivity lines. This comes from the thermodynamic nature of this, the Langmuir ice term. So uh, we see that one, selectivity does not give us the full picture of the separation. As you can see, when you change, uh, when you increase selectivity, we have varying different, uh, a, a large difference in performance as you go along the selectivity line. We also find that uh, the best performance lies when the nitrogen uh, is low and almost non-adsorbing, which again is uh, something intuitively uh, thought of. And then we find that at low CO2 affinities, uh, this process is not feasible, as shown by this gray region here, as well as if we were to indiscriminately increase our CO2 capacities, we also don't see a, a, a real advantage because uh, it inherently means that the regeneration uh, uh, for these sharper isotherms becomes uh, challenging for our uh, process. Uh, and here just as a reference, I've put in the, the three materials that I've uh, I was talking about earlier, zeolite 13X, UTS, and ISERP. And we see that uh, the, the final performance for these materials also fall on this sort of uh, 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 trend with the performance as well. So uh, in conclusion, I like, I'd like to uh, reiterate that uh, uh, this sort of supervised machine learning model where isotherms are also inputs to our uh, process is fast and accurate at uh, emulating a, a, a PSA model. Uh, this can be used for constraint-based multi-objective optimizations and thus can be used for screening and also to find where the interesting materials could lie. Uh, and I'd like, to thank my uh, colleagues at the, the Un uh, University of Alberta. They ha I've been working there for almost six years now, and each day has been uh, really, really interesting because of all of them. Thank you again. And I'd also like to thank uh, uh, thank my funding agencies, which are NSERC, Future Energy Systems. And I'd also like to thank uh, Compute Canada for uh, allowing me uh, uh, computational access to do all of these numerical an uh, analysis. Uh, thank you, and any questions? Thank you very much, Nagash. Um, I always find the people very interesting every time I see a presentation from you or your group, so thank you. We already have a question from YouTube from uh, Dimitri Lapsin. Okay. Is maple suitable only for CO2 adsorption in PSA processes, or is it possible to design other adsorption processes for other for adsorption of other gases? So essentially, what maple does, or in this case, what I've been trying to do is to predict the the performance indicators for one specific process, which is CO2 capture. But uh, the modeling framework is similar for any given process. So as long as you have a detailed model that can uh, uh, well represent your final uh, process, we can take the data that is generated by this detailed model as well as the other inputs like your uh, thermodynamic material inputs and we can create a maple 2.0, maple 3.0 for other gas separation processes as well. Uh, so there is no uh, real, uh, 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 nothing stopping us from doing that. It's just that we need to be sure that the detailed model is well representative of uh, the final process, as well as uh, making sure that, uh, well, uh, the out, uh, if if the if the final results are not as good as for the CO two capture case study, there are always machine learning algorithms that can help us improve the 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 the, the final prediction. So. Uh, to get us to this high level of accuracy took a bit of uh, training and validation uh, for sure, but it can easily be replicated now that we know some of the, the intricacies involved with, especially with uh, regards to sampling. Thank you. I think there's actually a great question um, to follow up a little bit on the training. Uh, so okay. a question by Nick Wilkins is uh, how well should the model learning model fit the training data set to set to accurately predict process performance? For example, what are the um, are the values of R, R squared that are that you would consider uh, adequate? 
Uh, so, because this is a controlled, uh, what I would describe as a controlled experiment. So we know all the inputs that are varying in this case, and we know the uh, we have the outputs. So it's essentially uh, how best we can create a a a, a, fun a function that can fit the inputs to the outputs. Uh, so uh, the training accuracy for these models uh, should be almost as high as possible, so 0.999 R squares and so on. But what is very uh, important and interesting is that it should be able to predict uh, the, the optimal regions or regions that we have not really uh, sampled very well. And that's why testing accuracy as well as uh, accuracy with regards to like final uh, optimal conditions is also very important. So I would look at test uh, an independent test set R square of 0.98 or 0.99 as a has a very good indicator, and we can see that already with the the, the parity plots I've shown here. Purity, for example, has a very good R square even in the in the case for any test condition, while recovery not so much. So uh, this can be improved by either adding more uh, data points to our uh, our training set or by uh, increasing the complexity of our uh, network or maybe using a better al uh, algorithm to optimize this uh, neural network. Thanks, Nagash. Um, a follow-up question always by Nicholas hmm. is, uh, which machine learning models seem to do the best job predicting the process performance given that the training data is sufficiently fitted then? Uh, so, uh, the models that we are using here are uh, artificial neural network, which uh, a multi-layered artificial neural network. But I've also found uh, uh, more traditional machine learning models such as Gaussian process regression can handle smaller data sets. But what we find is with the larger data sets that we have to go to, uh, to capture the entire decision space, let's say, uh, we have to use something like a neural network, which is which has the ability to handle larger and larger data. Thanks, Nagash. For the time being, I think we have uh, no more question. There is Celio Cavalcanti thanking you for your talk and complimenting you. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, I would actually like to ask something. It's a very simple question, but I'm I'm not sure I understood correctly. How do you how in in Maple and in your detailed model how you how do you actually consider competitive absorption? So we uh, we use a extended single side Langmuir model. So the competitive behavior is captured by the denominator here, where we uh, use both the CO two as well as the nitrogen uh, parameters uh, in the denominator. So this uh, extended form tends to describe the, the, the competitive behavior between CO2 and nitrogen for uh, at least theoretically, this is the, 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 the model that best fits our behavior. Uh, we could definitely look at different ways we can uh, capture this competitive behavior using other functionalized forms. But for, uh, for this case, we've used an extended single side Langmuir model. Thank you, Nagash. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, Nagash, I'm just going to take the screen from you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you both Danny and Nagash for your presentations. We also thank all of the attendees for joining this webinar. And we hope that it was both educational and enjoyable. An edited version of this webinar will be posted to the IAS YouTube channel with an announcement on the IAS Twitter feed. The hope is that the work discussed today will be a useful resource for the absorption science community in the future. Um, our next IAS webinar will be on August 17th, ELSA at 10 a.m. EST, with the remaining best poster award winners of the inaugural Twitter poster conference. The one following that in September will be given by Hideki Tanaka, um, and we will update you of the date when we have one. Announcements regarding the upcoming webinars and other IAS online events will be posted to our Twitter feed and will be emailed to you through the IAS mailing list. We hope that you will join us.